اوكي The one who comes in peace is always welcome. The one who comes to teach is always welcome. The one who comes to learn is especially always welcome. Positive energy and creation energy to all of you out there in the organic African paradigm. I would like to welcome you to another dark mystery school, 360 dimension of African soul, African intelligence and African science. Um, we cover the five mysteries of, of Africa, the five mysteries. Uh, the dark mystery of water, the dark mystery of fire, the dark mystery of nature or, or plant, the dark mystery of minerals, and the dark mystery of earth. Those are the five science of Africa. And in the dark mystery school, we I teach you these things. I come here and I teach you these things. I give you the explanations of the uh, ancient African worldview. So um, this is a good time for you to share the link with everybody you know. Um, share the link with everybody you know. And who is here, who's watching so I know, put your, uh, uh, put your greetings in the comment if you are here watching. So I know who you are. If you are watching, put your greeting in the comment. Uh, greet the teacher. Make sure you let the teacher know. Um, so uh, let me, I'm sharing the link uh, quickly on Twitter. Okay, I have done my part to share the link and those of you out there share the link as well. Um, Okay. All right. So Today we will be talking about Nefertum, um, the Lord of Love. Um, there is a in in the previous lecture. Um, I was ex I was teaching you about. Let me see what the previous lecture was about. So. In a previous lecture, I was explaining what Konshu was, and in the one before that, I explained uh, who Nimrod was. Um, those of you who don't know what Nimrod is or what Nimrod was, I explained that in the pre uh, the last two lectures. And the lecture before that, I explained the three greatest men of, of the ancient African worldview. But there is a, 
I made a mistake in the in that particular lecture, and I said that Atum was the um, Atum because the way they explain who Atum is, they say that Atum is the complete man. Atum is the man who has ascended, the man who has become a uh, god in a sense, right? So the God man, the man who has ascended, the man who has become beyond a uh, human being. So that man is the complete man. That man is the Atum, right? Um, the rest of the other men, which is Asar, Asar deals with the man of nature. So um, the Twa people, the Bantu people, all those people in the, in the forest, in nature, that are men of nature, they know nature, right? Uh, these are people we call Asar. They are those... Uh, you know, people of nature. Then we have the people of the world, modern men and women like ourselves. These are the people of set. These are the people of the world. Then we have the ascended man. The ascended man or the cultivated man, the cultivated man is represented as the falcon, the free man. So the free man in Africa, they have something called the free will of the people. In Africa, in ancient Africa, everything was about freedom. <laughs> the people's culture was all about freedom. Every single dimension of the people's culture was about freedom. And somehow it ended up being the opposite of freedom. It ended up becoming a thing of control, a thing of domination, which was not what it was intent intended for originally. Originally, the African culture was simply a culture about freeing the human being. It was about cultivating the human being. It was about establishing great uh, uh, principles in the human mind or ideas in the human mind for the human mind to uh, and the human heart to work together to achieve greatness or to be governed by the behavior and character of greatness. That was why the original things that the ancient Africans set for themselves was set up. They established their culture and their system to teach the African men and women ideas or principles that could govern their mind, their mind, because the human mind is governed by ideas, is governed by what they call ideology. Ideology means the study of ideas. Okay, that's the, the has to logy means the study, and then idea means idea, the study of ideas, ideology. But when we are talking about ideas, we are talking about concepts and principles that the mind grasps onto, that the mind catches, and the mind keeps inside of itself, inside of its realms. These ideas govern the mind. All the people on earth, their minds are governed by ideas. If you put great ideas in their minds, you make great people. You create people who are great, great beings. They become great. If you put negative ideas, terrible ideas into people, you create the same destructive effects those negative ideas have. You create the destructive effects that bad ideas, self-destructive ideas have. You create that in people. So the ancient Africans, they live by these principles. Their goal, their role on this earth was to cultivate the human being. And that was the most important thing to our ancestors. It was more important than anything else, cultivating the human being, developing the human being making sure that the human being was awakened that, and the human being was motivated and the human being was movement, moving in life, movement, had movement in life, and the human being was centralized and then the human being could ascend. Those are the five, pill, those are the five, uh, uh, um, how do you call it? Um, life governing principles. The five life governing principles or the five uh, 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 principles of life, right? 
I, I give me a second here. Let me find the 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 proper uh, terminology for it. Give me one second here. I'll find the proper terminology for it. Let's go to let's go to the school here for a, for a second, and in the school we'll be able to find uh, what we are looking for. So let's go to the school. And what are we looking for? We are looking for, um, let's try this one here and see what it says. Let's try the unlimited pathways. Let's try the vital to life. Okay. The vital to life philosophy, the five functionality of life. The five functionality of life. What does functionality mean? What does functionality mean? What does for something to function, what does that mean? So I'm going to look up the word functionality. Okay, functionality means this, the quality or state of being functional. Okay, A, the quality or state of being functional. Okay, uh, let's see here. Functional uh, of connected with being with with being a function affecting physiological or psychological functions uh, used to contribute to the development or maintenance of a larger whole. So this is what I was looking for. Functionality means the development and maintenance of the larger whole. So when if if like for something to be in its most effective and efficient state, that thing is in the state of functionality. So the five functionality of life, of life, according to the ancient Africa, the things that they were teaching in Kemet, in the original Kemet, I'm not talking about the one that the Europeans created and then the, uh, the Egyptologists created. I'm talking about the original Kemet, the Nubia Kemet, the philosophy of Nubia Kemet. They were teaching the, the five functionalities of life, which was the first functionality of life is awaken. We are all going to awaken. Everybody will awaken. The second functionality of life is motivation. Everybody needs to be motivated. Whether it's love that's going to motivate you, what is power that's going to motivate you, what is money that's going to motivate you, what is sex that's going to motivate you, what is greed, hate, eh, whatever the motivation that's going to motivate you, this is one of the five functionalities of life. Then the third functionality of life is movement. Every day of your life, you must move. Nobody lays in bed and do this all day. You must blink your eye. You must breathe in and out. Your heart must move, otherwise you are dead. So you must have movement. The best, the greater your movement is, the more movement you have in life, the more activity you have, the more power you have, the more essence you have. That's what movement is. Going to the gym. When you go to the gym and you exercise, this is called movement. What happens when you go to the gym for a long time, you go to the gym for a, a, a six months, what happens? You start to develop muscles. You start to develop muscles. You start to get stronger core strength. This is because of the movement. You are moving the body, the muscle, and the muscle is generating power. This is the one of the five functionality of life, which is movement. The fourth functionality of life is centralization. Centralization is the unification of the four elements within ourselves. All human beings are made of four elements. Everybody, including myself, including yourself, and there is nobody who is not made of four elements. However, all of you out there, you have been taught you are made of only one element. So you've been taught you're made of Aries. You've been taught you're made of cancer only. You've been taught you've made of Capricorn only. You've been taught you're made of only one element, 
right? Which is fire, which is air, which is the, uh, uh, you've been taught that by the Western ideology, Western school of thought, you've been taught these things, but that is not true. In the African conception, in the African worldview, you are made of four elements, and those four elements are the four uh, uh, signs that you have, right? So you might be, I might be an Aries, then my, that is my fire sign. And then my, my, my air, my air sign that fuse my fire, this sign is called Libra. But then I have two other signs as well, which makes up the four elements. When I cultivate these four elements, I gain the fifth element, and this fifth element is what gives me uh, uh, the power. It's what cultivates me. It's what manifests my reality. So we can only manifest our reality when we are cultivated through these, when we cultivate these five elements in ourselves. When we cultivate water within, when we cultivate the, the, the earth within the body, the physical body, when we cultivate the mineral body, when we cultivate the, uh, um, the fire body, when we cultivate the air body, we cultivate the five bodies within. And this is what people call the awakening or the ascended one, right? This is what people call Atum, the complete one. So Atum represent the ascend, the complete one, the one who is complete. That means this one has become a, a divine being. This one is no longer uh, in the state of human being. So in the days of our ancestral time, they said that when they were born, they were born with an awakened pineal gland. So unlike us today who are born and we have to you know, grow up and then awaken the pineal gland, during the time of Atum, the original uh, ancestors, they were born with an awakening pineal gland. The pineal gland was always active. It never went off. It was always active. They were born with it. They, 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 it couldn't go off. It was just always there. They, the pineal gland was the source of their way of life. Okay? So these ancestors were called the complete one. They were called the complete one, and they were one with nature. They were one with nature. They were called the plant people, the plant beings. They were identified as the trees of life. They were identified as the tree of life. And these trees bear the fruits of knowledge and wisdom. These trees that were bear the fruit trees of knowledge and wisdom. And each of these trees had an activated serpent. They had an activated serpent. Every one of them had an activated serpent. Right, the serpent is considered the God aspect, right? The God aspect of people, the divine aspect of people, right? This is what people are aiming for. They're aiming to gain consciousness. They're aiming for consciousness so they can ascend, so they can become the ascended one, the awakened one, the divine one. So that is what this whole thing has been about. But these original ancestors, the complete ones, they used to have all this uh, stuff. And then gradually humanity lost the ability to activate the five functionalities of life. Human beings lost the five functionality of life. Human beings had a problem awakening. They couldn't even perform an awakening. They could not even awaken anymore, let alone uh, be motivated in life by the right things. They couldn't be motivated by the right things. And it's now they had no movement towards the right things in the universe anymore. Their movement were all towards the wrong things. And they had no centralization. They had no unity of self or unity within themselves, in their community, in their family anymore. And then they could not ascend anymore. So these were the things that occur. So in order for you to understand the African system better, you need to know what was originally there and then how it was changed, okay? So we are going to talk about the African version of love. Now, in the European culture, they have Romeo and Juliet. They have Valentine's Day, right? They have Valentine's Day, they have Romeo and Juliet, 
And every one of you young Africans out there, this past Valentine's Day, you were celebrating uh, love. You were celebrating these type of uh, things. This past Valentine's Day, you were celebrating these things. But originally, what were the ancient Africans' uh, version of love? What were the ancient Africans' uh, 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 school of love? What, were they, they, what was their, their system of love? Their system of love is called Nefertum. This is Nefertum. Now, the word Nefertum doesn't mean the. Uh, uh, I I didn't want to put the God of. I will put the house of love. So the house, or the palace. Let me put the palace of love. That is the better uh, title for the Nefertum is the palace of love. Nefertum refers to when the ancient African had, when they were, when you are born, there's certain age you as a youth needs to be initiated into the, into the spiritual system. You need to go through those system so that one day you can awaken and become is a, 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 a contributing member to the society. So in order for you as an African child born to African parents, in order for you to become a contributing member of the society, you had to go to the palace of love. You had to learn the, this uh, from the palace of love. You have to go to Nefertum. So the children were born in Kemet and they would go to Memphis, right? They're all the young, young boys and young girls would go to the, the, the Memphis and they would be initiated in the schools. And when they were initiated in the school, they came out awakened. They came out awakened. So this was what Nefertum is. It's the palace of love. So I will explain this whole system to you and you will know the story uh, behind this. So, Nefertum is the initiation into the spiritual awakening and the cultivation of the African youth. So any African youth, it does not matter if you are a man or a woman, in order for you to be cultivated, in order for you to become who you were meant to be, for you to become the best version of yourself, you had to go through the palace of love. And going through the palace of love, you now get to know what it means to be an African child, what it means to be an African boy, an African woman, an African man, and et cetera. You get to learn those things. So you go through initiation. The initiation into the spiritual system, one, and then the cultivation of who you are, your gifts, everything that you brought into the world, the cultivation. So it is the school of love and desire. Now, you see this photo, you've all seen this photo here before. This is called, according to the Greeks, this is called Horus the child, Heru the child. And Heru the child, in his, he's standing on the back of the crocodile. He's standing on the back of two crocodiles, and he is holding the lion by his tail in his hand, and the scorpion by his, by his tail, and the serpent by his tail. He is holding the antelope by his horn, or the ram by his horn, uh, and he is either the ram or the antelope, he's holding it by the horn, he's holding the scorpion by his tail, and he's holding the serpent by his tail. So, and he's standing on the back of the crocodile. So this refers to the initiation of a young person, the initiation of children. This is the initiation system. So if you, if you notice in one hand, he has three animals. He has three animals in one hand. He has the warrior, the healer, and the, the intellect, the intelligence, right? He has the, the, the uh, uh, how do you call it, uh, the pride or the, the 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 arrogance of youthfulness or whatever you call the ego and he has the uh um, healer and he has knowledge again so this child is holding six 
beast of power in his hand. He's holding six beasts of power in his hand, and each of these beasts is a triangle. Each of these beasts represent a triangle. Okay, this is a triangle. And if you take these two triangles and you merge them together, if you take uh, these three beasts, I will show you here. Let me show you so you can see for yourself. If you take the three beasts, you draw a triangle, lion, serpent, and scorpion. So that's a triangle. Now you take another triangle, you draw it, then you say ram, a uh, ram or serpent, and what was the other one? Scorpion. And this is what you get. You get this. So you see, this is two triangles. Serpent, lion, and uh, serpent, lion, ram. Lion, sir, uh, this is how the system was set up in Kemet. Everything was based around a triangle. In, in Asia, in, in the country uh, we call, they call China, they have their own called the eight trigram, the eight triangular gram, right? The eight triangular or whatever you call the eight trigram, they have it, eight triangles. They have the eight triangles or something like that, right? In uh, 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 India, they have their own version of it and they put it on the three lines, they put it on the forehead of the people. In the Aztec world, they call it the star of Venus. In the Mesopotamia, what we call Mesopotamia or the Caldun Valley, they call it the star of Asarte or Venus. So in the Greek world, they call it the star of Hecate, the hexagram. They call it the hexagram, right? So this is to let you all know as Africans, as young Africans, every knowledge that the ancient African had, these knowledge were surrounded by the idea, these knowledge were surrounded by the idea of three. So we have the numerology. Let's go, go into African numerology. African numerology, one is divine. One is the highest number. One is the creator. One is the omnipotent force, right? That's one. That's the divine one. Two is duality. Two is male and female, darkness and light, right? Masculine and feminine, that's two. The three, it represents the power and the ability of two. So the power and the ability of two, it represents the pyramid. The pyramid is means the house of power. So the pyramid is the house of power of nature, the house of the power of nature. So that's what a pyramid is. A pyramid is called a triangle, a triangle. Pira means fire. Pira means fire. Pira means fire. And the, it's a triangle, a fire triangle. That's what a pyramid is, a fire triangle. So if you say pyramid, you're saying fire triangle. If you say um, the triangle, triangle can be any three mysteries of African, or, or African science that are required for you to cultivate certain power. Any three elements that are required for you to cultivate a particular power is a triangle. That's what you need to understand. So when they took the African children into initiation, they would teach them the, the science of the triangle. This is why the mathematical papyrus, the Rhine papyrus, the mathematical papyrus or the Rhine papyrus had within it the triangular symbol. 
This is why in every zodiac, right? In every zodiac, there is the winter triangle in uh, the, the, uh, the zodiac or the constellations, they, uh, the astrology, they have the winter triangle, the summer triangle, the spring triangle, and the, uh, what's the other one? The fall triangle. They have different triangles. So these different triangles all represent the, exactly what I am telling you. They all represent these things I'm, I'm teaching you right now. That's what the, th the triangle. So the triangle was the symbol of African, the, the mysteries. The mystery system is the symbol, the triangles. There are different triangles because there are different numbers of principles. There are eight principles of uh, which the Europeans took. Uh, they call it the seven hermetic principle. But there's actually eight hermetic principle or there's eight principles of the house of life. The eight principles of the house of life, there are eight principles of the house of life. And each of those principles has a three gram or a trigram, a trigram. Each of them has a trigram. And that is how the principles are set up. Now, I don't know any of these principles offhand. I don't know uh, the, the intricacies of those principles um, because it, these would be the people who are part of the priesthood. They would know this type of stuff, but not someone like me, right? I can explain to you what they are and what the triangle means in Africa. I can explain what the triangle is to you, but I cannot tell you what type of element they were using, okay? What specific type of element they were using because you have to be uh, initiated for you to know the specific type of element. But in the case of this, uh, the initiation of children, they cultivate the intelligence of the children and they call they, 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 they tame the ram, the ram, which is the energy, the strength of the, the, the force of the children there, you know, and then they try to make the, 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 you know, they try to cultivate the warrior aspect of the children and they try to cultivate various aspects of the African children. So this is why the initiation was important in ancient Africa. It was there to, it was meant to cultivate African children. It was meant to develop the African children. Okay? So. Now, this is Nefertum. If you go to uh, the Greek, the Greek would call, uh, they would have their own, uh, they would call it something. You go to the Hindus, you go to the Chinese, all of them would have their own version of this stuff. But in Africa, the one, the, uh, the, the God of love or the, or the deity of love or the, 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 one that, the, the, the one that was responsible for love, it's called Nefertum, the lotus. It is represented as the lotus. The symbol of love is the flower, the flowers, not just the flowers, but all, not just the lotus, but all types of flower. All the flowers are representation of Nefertum. He is the God of flowers. He is the Lord of flowers because flowers are associated with relationships. It's associated with love. So he is the Lord of the flowers. He is the Lord of the Prince of the Flowers, the Lord of the Flowers, and the Lotus is the King of all the flowers. The Lotus is considered the ruler of all the flowers. Just like we have the Lion, who is the King of all the animals, the Lotus is the, the plant that rules all the, all the other plants, right? All the other uh, uh, vegetation. Now, have you all seen this stuff on these women? These are South Sudanese women. And you've all seen them wear. You've all seen this. There's a movie called Avatar, which uh, these uh, Europeans came to Africa and they saw the African culture and they copied the African culture and they were able to create a movie. This movie made billions of dollars off of African culture. And this movie was able to basically uh, make them enrich them. But they took the, 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 the clothes, the, these things that the African women wear, the minat. They took the minat and they put it in this character in the Avatar movie. This priestess, she's wearing the minat and all the people, but they got this from Africa. Now, 
what is the Menat and what does it have to do with uh, Nefertum? Nefertum himself or Nefertum itself is the journey from adolescence to manhood. Nefertum is the journey from adolescence to manhood, right? Nefertum represents or means the uncultivated, uncultivated child. When the child is uncultivated, the child will become a troublemaker. The child will become a problem child to the society. And the child that is not developed, the child will become a criminal in the society. The child will become a pain in the, in the, in the society if the child is not cultivated. So the African people used to cultivate their children. They didn't used to raise children. So the idea of raising children came from the Europeans, right? Who they used to raise cattle. They used to raise goat. They used to raise slaves. So they came up with the idea of raising uh, our children. They came up with that idea, raise your children. In Africa, we don't raise children. We cultivate children in ancient Africa. They don't raise children. They cultivate children, right? The idea was that between the age of, I believe the age is uh, 10 to 16, there is there all the energies, all the original energies of the universe, all the primordial energies of the universe, those energies are going to awaken in the young child, right? They call this puberty. In, in Western culture, they call this puberty. In African culture, it's not called puberty. It is called, it is an, it is a period when all the energies, original energies of the universe awakens inside of a human being. When a human being turns a certain age, from the age of 10 to 16, all the original energies that the universe was created, the universe was made from, those original energies are going to start awakening in the human child. And when the child starts, uh, those uh, energies are awakening in that child, the energies are going to start to control the child. They're going to start making the child, uh, uh, you know, controlling the behavior and the character of the child. If the energy say hit this other person, the, per the child will want to fight. If the energy say lie, the child will want to lie. If the energy says steal, the child will want to steal. So all these original energies that are in the universe, they start to awaken in the child and the child starts to change spiritually, psychologically, and every other way. And so the child needs to go through initiation. So the African child needs to go through initiation and through their initiation, the African child will be able to control all this, the primal energies. They will be able to control all the primal energies and they will be able to transform these energies and be able to use these energies for the functionality of their life. So between age 10 to, remember, what did I say about the number 10? The number 10 represents destruction, right? So when the children ten, turn 10, all the destruction energy awakens in them. Before they, attend, they turn 10, they are just pure creation energy. Children are just pure creation energy. But the minute they turn 10, all the destructive energies now start to awaken in them. They can actually do damage to the society. They can actually cause severe problems in the society. So when this, they turn 10, they have to be developed in such a special way that they do not become a de destructive force in the society. So this is what nephrotum means. Nephrotum is this stage of puberty when an African child becomes potentially dangerous to the society. The idea uh, when all the primal energies of the creator of Atum awaken in the child is released into children, it causes the change and the transformation inside their body. Nefertum is the palace or the house of the youth. Nefertum means the palace or the house of the youth. This palace where the youth are educated and the youth are developed into the society. They are initiated into the society. So today in Africa, we go, we, our children go to school. 
for our children go to school, right? And they go and they go learn A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, right? And then they learn uh, 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 the Mississippi River. And then they learn the, the, the Queen of England, all these stuff that got nothing to do with who they are. In ancient Africa, the children did not learn such foolishness. They didn't even know what the Mississippi River was. They didn't know what this or that was or the Queen of England was. The children of Africa used to learn how to control the primal energies of changes and transformation in their body. That was what they were taught first. Okay? So when our children used to leave the house and go to this house of, house of children, house of the youth, they would learn the, the, the ways of Nefertum. And through this learning the ways of Nefertum, they would become members of the society in this way. All right, that was the education of youth. If the African boy does not go through the process of Nefertum, according to our ancestor, he will become a problem to the society and will eventually cause all sorts of mischief in the society. He will become a problem to the society and he will cause all types of mischief in the society. He will become a drug dealer. He will become all a criminal or, or many things if the child doesn't go through the process of nefertum. And even he might not become a drug dealer or a, or, or a person, but he might become lazy. He might become someone who doesn't want to work, who doesn't care, who's not motivated, who has no, uh, uh, no like, He's missing all the aspect of who he should be. He's missing these things because he didn't go through the process of nephertum. So you must, as a young man, go through the process of nephertum. And when you go through this process, you emerge, you become a full idealized man, a near complete man. Okay, you become the near complete man. So in order for us to, the ancient African, to curb this problem, to, to solve the problem of the youth, they created the Trinity of Memphis. Who are the Trinity of Memphis? The Trinity of Memphis is Sekhmet, Patah, and Nefertum. Those are the Trinity of Memphis. So if you see right here, it says Nefertum means the beautiful one. Right, and I'm going to explain. Uh, originally, a lotus flower at the creation of the world. So they say Nefertum was the original flower that existed at the beginning of the world. Right? Who raised? Who rose from the primo primordial water? Nefertum represents both the uh, first sunlight and the delightful smell of the Egyptian lotus flower, having raised from the primordial water within Egyptian blue water lily. So this is the Egyptology translation of the of Nefertum. However, Nefertum is, represents the flowers. The lotus is the king of the flowers, but Nefertum represents all the beautiful flowers. Everything that is associated with love, everything that is associated with desire, beauty, Light, enlightenment, all of those things, Nefertum represents all of those things. Nefertum represents every dimension of beauty. It, it covers all levels of beauty. Anything that is beautiful, Nefertum represents that. So it is the flowers represent beauty. That's why on Valentine's Day, you go and give your lovers flowers and candy, etc. right? You give them things. Because originally in Africa, Nefertum was the original, was one of the original energy. The energy of love was the original energy that caused the universe to come into existence. It was because of love or the energy of love and the energy of beauty that brought the creation into existence. So those were the original concept that existed in the beginning that came out of the primordial waters of Nun. The concept of beauty and the concept of love and the concept of those things came out of the primordial water. They're all called Nefertum. Now, some of the title of Nefertum is he who is beautiful and water lily of the sun and it's in the book of the dead. They say it's in the book of the dead. 
rise like Nephertum from the blue water lily to the nostrils of Ra. So basically, how the flower or the fragrance impact the human senses, how they are aphrodisiac. They call it aphrodisiac, meaning the smell. If you if you they arouse the body, they stir the eyes, they stir the sense of excitement, of, of love or lust even, they stir all the passions of a human being. Flowers stir the passions of the human being. Uh, that's why human beings smell flowers. So smelling the flower, all these things, all goes to this. It all speaks about within Nephertum. And come forth upon the zenith each day. So come forth upon the zenith in the sky each day, right? So Nephertum was eventually seen as the sun of Ptah, the termite mound. So Ptah is the termite mound. Okay, Ptah is the termite mound. And the termite mound represents the original creator, the, uh, the where the, the, the Africans came out of the womb, the original womb that the ancient Africans came out of. The, they call it the termite mound. In Kenya or, or Uganda or Tanzania, uh, go to your village and ask them about the termite mound. Go to any one of the villages in Congo, Cameroon, Kenya, uh, 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 Ghana, Nigeria, and ask them what does the termite mound represent. Go to the Igbo and ask them what is the meaning of the termite mound. They will tell you that the termite mound is where human beings came out of. The, the creator of the human beings was human beings came out of the termite mound. The termite it represents the human being. Why? The, the termite represents the creation of human being. Why? Because termites are the creatures in nature who create nitrogen. They create nitrogen. They're the ones who take down the trees, they eat the trees, they eat the wood, or the wood, the dead leave the dead plants, they eat the dead plants, and they synthesize, synthesize the, the dead plants to create the four nitrogen bases of the DNA. They create the four nitrogen bases of the DNA, and those nitrogen bases are we human beings, this is what we call our DNA. But it comes from the termites. The termites are the ones who create this. So this is why they say Africans were born from the termite mound, because it it is that system. So originally, these are go to your village. If you don't believe me, go to your village and ask your, your, your people, why do we eat termite? Ask them, why do we eat termites in, during the rain season? One, and ask them what is the termite hill represents? Two, and then you will see what they are talking about. It's the hill of knowledge. The termite hill is the hill of knowledge. It's called the hill of knowledge, the hill of consciousness. In a, 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 a dream that I had, and I was being taught about the termite mound, when I was being told about the termite mound by the ancestors, this is what they said. I saw the children of the children pointing to the termite hill. And they said, that is the boring hill. You know why they call the boring hill, the termite hill? Because they were forced to sit on top of it and meditate. They were forced to sit on top of the termite hill and cross their legs and meditate. And this meditation was supposed to awaken their mind. It was supposed to awaken them. So they call it the boring hill because the children don't like to sit still, right? But it is meditation hill. And Pata is the awakened one. Pata is the most, the Lord of intelligence, the Lord of all knowledge, the developed mind, right? So Pata represents the one who has been cultivated the one who has emerged from the termite mound. Okay, that's what Pata represents. Pata is the termite mound, but the master of the termite mound. Okay, now let's continue here. The goddess Sekhmet. Sekhmet represents the African people's concept of justice, morality, behavior, and character. That's what Sekhmet represents. Sekhmet represents a, a lot of the ideals of the free will of the people. Everything that is associated with power, democracy, what the African people call the free will of the people. That's what Sekhmet represents. Sekhmet represents power.
that does not oppress people. Power that does not destroy people, but power that protects the free will and the justice of the people. That's what Sekhmet represents. So um, now you understand why Nefertum, the child Nefertum, will be in the house of Patah and Sekhmet. Why our children, the young, the youth of Africa, why they would need to go to the house of Patah and Sekhmet in order for them to learn. Because if Patah is the manifested, awakened intelligence that came from the termite mound, the master of the termite mound, and Sekhmet represents all the principles of power, leadership, good governance, the free will of the people, protecting and defending the free will of the people, freedom from oppression, freedom from injustice, all these things, if Sekhmet represents the kind of power that does not oppress, that does not destroy, if Sekhmet represents that power of justice and balance against tyrants, the power against tyrants, the power against destroyers, the power against oppressors, if Sekhmet represents that, then this means that the children, Nefertum, when they get initiated into all these systems, the children, the African children will become the very best version of themselves. So this is why they had to go to this house to get initiated. Now, nefer is a word for wind. Nefer is the word for wind. It's for the word for breath. It's the word for air, right? It's the word representing breath, air, all of these things. Nefer represents all of that, okay? Nefer means the flying one. Flowers, how flowers when the breeze blow, how flowers can flow in the air and, and, and they can travel. The breeze can blow the flower petals and the flower petals can swerve in the wind. This is all part of Nefertum. Nefertum represents the hot summer air, the hot summer wind. Nefertum represents the rising air, the wings of the hawk. Nefertum represents the wings of the hawk, the traveler, the adventurer, the winds of greatness, the air, you know, great joy. Nefertum represents great joy. Nefertum represents the heat of sexuality, the heat of, uh, of, of, of in, uh, in the body, right? Passion. Nefertum represents the passion and all of these things. Now, there is a Dagara priest. There is a Dagara priest who passed away. His name is Meledoma Patrice Somme. Meledoma Patrice Somme and his wife is, uh, I forgot her name. Her name is also Sobonfu Somme. He has a book called Of Water and Spirit. Meledoma Patrice Somme. He is the one who I learned the, the Dagara wheel or, or the Dagara wheel, the wheel called the Dagara wheel, the five African element. He was the one I learned the five African element from uh, I, by, by reading his book and learning his, his teachings. I was able to learn what the five elements of Africa was, the five, the medicine wheel. I was able to learn about the five, me, uh, five medicine or, or the medicine wheel from uh, uh, Melodoma. So Melodoma is one of the most, uh, the greatest spiritual teacher uh, of of African culture, right? Because he explained um, the concept of the five elements. He explained um, what do you call it? Uh, initiation, how he was initiated, etc. Right. So that book, Water and Spirit, is a good book um, for you to learn a little more about um, the thing, the same thing that was happening in Kemet, but you can learn from it from the from the Dagara people. They're the ones who are best uh, uh, associated with Kemet um, in, in, in terms of the knowledge, right? So let me continue here. Uh, Meladoma Patrice Somme says in, in his book, Water and Spirit, the Dagara people of Burkina Faso call the initiation, bar. So the word that the Dagara people call initiation is bar right what is initiation or what is bar 
bar or initiation is cultivation of the potential gifts that when developed will benefit the African society. So every African child that is born has a potential gift that they bring that when this uh, 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 child is cultivated and developed, their gifts will benefit the African society. But when the child is neglected, ignored, and does not, it's not cultivated, the child will destroy the society, right? So there's an African say, um, if the village does not uh, embrace the child, the child will, will light the fire. It will burn the, the, the village down to feel the, the heat of the, of the village. So basically, either the village embrace the child and develop the child, or the child will light the fire and burn the village down, pretty much. Right, so this is how the ancient Africans understood children. They understood children as coming into the world with gifts. And when these gifts are developed, these gifts will benefit the society. So before we ask our children to give us what they bring from the, from the, the spirit world or the inner realm, right? What, before we ask our children to bring, the, to give us the gift, the benefits that they brought with us, First, we have to give them the gift of cultivation. We have to give them the cultivation. We have to develop them. We have to spend time uh, uh, developing their potential so that they can give us that gift that they brought from the, the, the spirit world. But when we fail to do this, they will become our problem. They will cause problems to society and they will possibly destroy the society because of this. So, we must first we must first give them something in kind equal in measure that they will be able to fully give us what they brought with them from the spirit world so this is how the ancient africans used to understand children all right life according to the ancient africans according to the ancient african life is about duty responsibility and fidelity to each other Life is about duty, responsibility, and fidelity to each other. Life is about our mandate of the creator. So every, uh, all, every one of us are here to contribute to the mandate of the creator. Uh, and we are going to bring, we bring something as they call the potential gift that is cultivated. And then this gift, we give it to the, the society to benefit the African society. And then the African society fulfills the mandate of the creator. And this is how the ancient African uh, civilization was operated by. So ancient Africans said life is about truth, about finding the truth. Life is about finding the truth, living with trust or living by trust. So you must be trustworthy. You must be able to live by trust. You must be trustworthy. So life is about finding truth, right? Finding the truth. And then life is about living by trust. Life is about measuring our thoughts, our speech and our actions. So that means measuring means you balance your thoughts, your speech and your action. You cultivate, you control, or you discipline, the, the, you measure, you carefully, you carefully measure or, 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 or detail how much you know, things you, your thoughts and your speech are going to do what they are going to do. You control them, you discipline them, right? And then achieving expediency. So achieving expediency of happiness, joy, fulfillment. So life was about being able to achieve the expediency of happiness, joy, and fulfillment. And most of all, life is about empowered, being empowered to fulfill all your previous duties. This is what the children were taught. They were taught life is about finding the truth, living by trust, measuring your thought, speech, and action, achieving the expediency of happiness, joy, and fulfillment, and most of all, at, uh, in being empowered to attain and fulfill all the previous duties and responsibility. This is what the children were taught at Nefertum, the house of children. So Nefertum, children, Nefertum says children are the foundation of life. According to Nefertum, 
it says children are the foundation of life. They are the beginning and the end of life. According to Nefertum, children are the beginning and the end of life because they are the beginning and the end cycle of everything. When we are born, we are like children. When we grow old, we become like children, right? So this is what Nefertum represents. That is why the, 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 the beetle or Kepri represents the dawn, right? So, and that dawn, uh, when it goes to Amun, Amun metamorphs back into the beetle. Amun transforms into the beetle, right? So that's what Kepri represents. Um, so children are the foundation of life. They are to be cultivated. The duty of the society is the society must cultivate the children, develop the children through the soul, the soul aspect, the intelligence aspect, and the science aspect, right? They must teach the children soul, intelligence, and science. Their minds are to be developed and their souls are to be developed so that the children can achieve balance. This is the, the school of Nefertum. So the human embodiment or what we call nature is subject to culture. So human nature is the subject to culture, but the human spirit is subject to nature. So listen to this again. Human nature is subject to culture, right? So human nature, when somebody say, oh, it's just human nature. No, that's human culture. Human spirit is subject to nature. So when you say that is the power of the human spirit, then you are saying this is the power of nature. When you are saying that, oh, that's human nature, you're saying this is the culture, human culture. Okay? That's the difference. So the human spirit is subject to nature, and the human nature is subject to culture. All right? And the human soul, or the soul, S-O-U-L, the human soul is subject to divinity. The human soul is subject to beauty and divinity. Beauty and divinity. That's the human soul. It is subject to beauty and divinity. The human nature is subject to culture. And the human uh, spirit is subject to nature. The power of nature. All right? Nefertum is the vital to life philosophy of functionality concerning the nature, which is the subject to culture, the human spirit, which is the subject to nature, and the human soul, which is the subject to beauty and divinity. Thus, the cultivation of the African by the method of the soul. So according to Africa, according to the ancestral culture, to cultivate the human being or to cultivate the African child, you must cultivate the human soul first, you must cultivate the beauty and the divinity of the child first, right? And when you cultivate the beauty and the divinity of the child, then you must cultivate the intelligence of the child, which is pata. When you cultivate the intelligence of the child, which is pata or sekhmet, then now you cultivate the science of the child, which is uh, what they were doing, uh, creativity, et cetera, you cultivate that. And this makes the child the perfect one, the complete one. And the child can now become atom. The child can now contribute to the society. So the method of the soul, the method of the intelligence, and the method of the science, you will give birth to the flying one. The flying one, the complete one, love and desire aspect of African. So there we will talk about next the butterfly necklace. We are going to talk about the butterfly necklace. So what is the butterfly necklace? This thing you see around her wearing around her, her, this garment she's wearing over here, this garment is called the manat. M-E-N-A-T, uh, -E manat. So if you go and Google the, the uh, manat, this is the butterfly necklace. This is called the butterfly necklace. Okay, the flower necklace, the flower necklace, all right? So this is, we are going to talk about the flower ne necklace and nephrotum. Um, 
Let's go here to BAST. Now BAST, you see she represents the enlightenment. She represents the uh, light. She represents the light, right? She represents the light itself, the light, right? The face that has been enlightened, the mind that is illuminated, right? So the, the, the beautiful face, the illuminated face, uh, she represents the woman who has achieved enlightenment, the highest level. Her mind is illuminated. Her mind is pure illumination, right? So vast was not just the energy. It was also the energy of fire, the energy of electricity. So today, the Europeans went to Africa. They saw how the Africans were dealing with electricity, and they took the science of electricity and they brought it and they made their whole society with electricity, right? So Bast is the person that deals with electricity. So the electricity of the universe, Bast is the mother of electricity. Okay, now let's continue here. Now, when a child goes into the destruction phase, according to the story, the children have a martial nature violence, the energy of violence, Amit. Amit is one of the energies that every human being is born with. Every human being is born with many, many different energies, but Amit is one of the energies that a human being is born with. And this energy is called the energy responsible for all violence in the universe. Amit is responsible for all violence, all destruction, any kind of destructive power. Amit is the, the energy that is responsible for all, all types of violence, right? So the ancient Africans decided that they had to cultivate the martial nature of the children, right? So what is, the, what is nature again? We say human nature, it represents, it is governed by culture. It is caused by human culture. Human nature is caused by human culture. The hum, human spirit is caused by nature. So nature is responsible for the human spirit and the human nature is caused by human culture. So if, if someone say, oh, that's just human nature, to, 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 err, to err is human nature. To do this and to do that or to do bad things, to kill, to murder is human nature and all those type of stuff. This is human culture that teaches them to murder. It's human culture that teaches them to do these bad things, right? It's not human nature. Human culture tells human beings to go and cause problems against other human beings. Human nature doesn't tell you to do all of that. Human spirit tells you to create beauty. Human spirit tells you to create a better society, to contribute, to love. Human spirit tells you these things. But human nature tells you the opposite, right? So they have to cultivate the martial culture. This is why the children were taught martial arts. In Africa, they stopped teaching martial arts to the children because they didn't want the children to, uh, you know, when the, when the old people, when they left Kemet, when the, when the society started to fight amongst themselves, when the society became too corrupt, the people stopped practicing the martial arts. African people stopped practicing the martial arts. They gave up on the martial arts and they started to dance more. They started to do, do, do more dancing and more singing because they were no longer interested in the martial arts. But what the martial arts does is, the martial arts is cultivates the martial nature. So that's what in Kemet, they used to teach them, the children martial arts. So they cultivated martial arts of children to adulthood. This was part of Nefertum. Nefertum, they would teach the children the philosophy of the warrior. The philosophy of the warrior was one of the philosophies that were taught to the children. So they might come to understand Kanum, they might understand Kanum, they might understand Nut, they might understand Asar, they might understand Ma'at, Ubuntu, and Muntu, the different variations of principles. They might understand all these principles so they could use it for the betterment of the society. So the defense of the law, the children were taught the defense of the law, protection of the law, and punishment by law. The children were taught Punishment by law, protection, protecting the law, and defending the law. They were taught the, the, the how to uphold the law of the society. 
This is what the young men were taught. When the young men uh, graduated from Nefertum, they were taught how to defend the law, protect the law, and to uh, and to uh, and the punishment of the law. They were taught these things. So um, to defend the greater good of the society, this was what Nefertum was created. Nefertum was created to defend the greater good of the African society. What is the five truths of the society? So the five truths of African society, Nefertum was what was created for the five truths. What are the five truths of Africa? Creator, nature, ancestor, ma'at, ubuntu. Those are the five truths of Africa. Creator, nature, ancestor, uh, uh, Ma'at Ubuntu, five truths of Africa. So the children were taught the five truths of Africa, and from this five truth they became Muntu. When they became Muntu, Muntu means they who adhere to the law, those who adhere to the customs of the land and the law of the land. That's those are Muntu, the protector, the defenders of Ubuntu and Ma'at. They are called Muntu. Okay, those are the, the children. So the children become Muntu when they graduate from this uh, this world. The children become Muntu when they graduate, okay? Now, let us continue here. Um, the mandate of the creator, Sekhmet is the house created from Kanum. So Sekhmet was created from Kanum, the house of Kanum. So what is the house of Kanum? The house of Kanum is the house of the mountain, the priesthood that used to go to the mountain and they used to pray on top of the mountain. So in ancient Africa, or if you go to the Maasai people of, or the, the Giguyu people, go to the Giguyu people, go to the Maasai, go to Uganda, go to Congo, go to uh, Cameroon, go to South Africa, go to any African, go to Ethiopia, go to any African country, the Africans said that the creator, to talk directly to the creator, Ngai or Olodumare or Chuku, to talk to directly to the creator, you had to go to the mountain. So you cannot talk to the creator from just any place in the world. Like contrary to the modern people's uh, way of life, they believe that they can talk to the creator just from uh, a building. They just build a building and then they say they're talking to the creator, no. The, in the ancient African worldview, they believe that you had to go to the mountain. And through meditation at the mountain, you would be able to talk to the creator. And when you came from the mountain, they, there would be a sign that you had, inter, you had met the creator because you, you will gain an awakened mind. You will gain an intelligence. You will gain some kind of a blessing from the mountains, right? And this is why the mountains were reserved for the Kanum, the mountain was for Kanum, Amun was the mountain, right? And then the church was the trees. The trees were the source of knowledge, wisdom, right? So the trees were called the source of knowledge, wisdom, and churches, right? The trees were like place you go and meditate. You go and meditate on the termite hill, on the tree, etc. And this is how they lived. So um, the house of Sekhmet was created from the mountain. During the age when our ancestors were the mountain people, they were on top of the mountain of the moon and all that place when they were dealing with the mountain area during the time period which they were on top of the mountains, this is where they, uh, this part of the story, uh, Sekhmet was created. Sekhmet was created, the lion was created during that age or the, the our ancestors first encounter the lions during that age and Sekhmet was created during that age. What is Sekhmet's job? Who is Sekhmet and what is her job? Sekhmet is power. Sekhmet is pure power and authority. The staff of power, authority, Sekhmet is power, but not just any power. Sekhmet is the power that cannot be corrupted. Sekhmet is the power that cannot be corrupted by anyone. So it's not a power, like today, if the president of South Africa, Sarah Ramaphosa was uh, uh, ruling by segment, right? Then he cannot be corrupt. He cannot be corrupted. Like Magufuli, John Magufuli would be someone who could not be corrupted, right? So John Magufuli is ruling by the power of segment. So segment is a power 
that protects the free will of the people, that protects the right of the people. Sekhmet is the power that protects the people against the tyrants, dictators, and oppressors. Sekhmet protects the people from that. So Sekhmet loves and upholds justice and upright character. And Sekhmet, most of all, upholds the free will of the people. They call the person that she loved the most Heru. They call the, chi the, the, the child that she loves the most, they call the child Heru, the ascended one. So Sekhmet loves the ascended man, the ascended man. That is who she loves. In uh, uh, the Igbo culture, they call um, the ascended man Amadioha, right? The ascended man Amadioha, right? Um, in other people's culture, they have the different kind of ascended man. But that's what uh, Sekhmet does. She loves the upright man, the ascended man. So Ibrahim Traore or Burkina Faso would be called, uh, uh, Thomas Sankara, all these would be the men who are, you know, the upright men. So that's what Sekhmet does. She protects the free will of the people against tyrants and oppressors. Sekhmet loves and a whole justice and upright character, uh, etc. Sekhmet is the cultivated martial nature into the martial elite. So there's two types, there's five different kinds of martial nature. There's five types of martial nature. There's the martial nature, but then there's the highest nature is the martial elite or the martial, the, the divine martial nature or the elite martial nature, right? So, uh, you know, in China, they have a Kung Fu master, right? Like an old man with a beard and he's always playing with his beard like this, this Kung Fu master where he can just fight with one hand. Yeah, 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 yeah. He do all this stuff with one hand, right? So... <laughs> This Kung Fu master, for the man to become an elite warrior, an elite Muntu, for the man to become the elite Muntu, this man has to go through what we call Sekhmet. Sekhmet is the one who teaches this man to become the elite warrior, right? So um, the elite warrior for the service of the African people. Sekhmet is African power and authority that is dutiful in union with fidelity and responsibility to the free will of the people. So Sekhmet is African power and authority that is dutiful and in union with uh, uh, and fidelity, union and fidelity and responsibility to the free will of the African people. That is what Sekhmet represents. So um, to cultivate the physical strength or to cultivate the strength of the physical body towards the pinnacle and the strength of the intelligence towards the pinnacle and the strength of the science towards the pinnacle, yet without being governed by destructive ideas, rather by the ideas of the five truths. This, this is what Nefertum, all this is included in Nefertum, what the young Africans were being taught in Kemet at Nefertum. They were being taught all these things that I'm telling you. So the women used to believe that once, uh, oh, oh, we are not going to talk about this. I'm going to skip this part here because I don't want to talk about this on YouTube. So let's um, let's not talk about this one on YouTube. It's not, it's not a good idea. Um, let me see here. So the creation of Nefertum. How was Nefertum created? Nefertum was a mutual decision between two houses. The two houses that created Nefertum were the houses of Kanum, the mountain, the priesthood, the mountain priesthood, and then the house of Hathor, right? The house of heaven, the women, the women's house. So there is this uh, egalitarian society in Africa, right? In ancient Africa, there was this egalitarian society. There were two priesthood, the priesthood of Kanum, who would go to the mountain to pray to, to Kanum, the Amun, the creator, and then the priesthood of Hathor, who would divine the stars. They who would divine the movement of the planets, the stars, the wisdom of the stars. They who could divine those things. So those were the two priesthood. And these two priesthood came together and they created Nefertum. They were the ones who created Nefertum. That Nefertum 
they debated and they and they talked about it that Nefertum was to be established to cultivate the young African men and women of the society to ensure that the men become the flying lotus, the blue lotus, to cause the men to ascend to become like the lotus. So from ordinary flowers for the men to reach the pinnacle of ordinary or, or flower awakening to become the lotus. So that's why in Asia they have the lotus. Uh, the lotus is a Buddha. The Buddha is represented as a lotus, etc. Right? But in ancient Africa, Nefertum is the lotus, but Nefertum is cultivated to become the lotus. He's cultivated to become the lotus. So in ancient Africa, they had their own sexual arts. So they established the sexual arts and the cultural or mating ritual, things like dancing, singing, poetry, dressing well, making your hair beautiful, making your hair beautiful, wearing clean clothes, uh, wearing fine clothes, and grooming your yourself, cleaning, washing, and your hygiene, washing your genitals and washing your rear end when you defecate, wash your rear end, and the mannerism, how to talk to women and how women should talk to men. They were taught these sexual arts in Nefertum, the house of Nefertum. They were taught all the sexual arts. Um, they were taught the types of love and relationship in Nefertum also. They were taught the types of love and relationship uh, were established at Nefertum as well. So Hathor, the mothers who deal with the science of the heavens and the stars, etc., and Kanum, the science of the earth, the, the one who deals with the science of the mountain and the earth, uh, taught the African youth the culture of Madi and Sia. What is Madi and Sia? Madi and Sia is divine love. It is love that is the greatest kind of love, sacrificial love, pure love. You know how Europeans have their highest version of love? They call it Romeo and Juliet. Europeans call the highest version of love Romeo and Juliet. In Africa, the highest version of love is Madi and Sia, right? It is a love, a, a true and sacrificial love, like deep, strong, potent love, right? It's very, very powerful love. So that's what it is. They were taught, the youth were told, and they explained the different kind of love to the youth. The youth were taught all the different types of love, and they were explained the love of Madi and Sia as well, the, the most potent kind of love. The women insisted, this, this is during the, the discussion between the two houses, Kanum and Hathor, during the discussion, the women insisted, it was the women who insisted that the men become handsome. Because the men used to be covered in ashes, the men used to be doing cow, uh, cleaning the, the cows, chasing, washing their hair with the cow urine and all that stuff. The men were doing all these things. So the women insisted that the men learn, you know, how to, to dress and do things and do all these things. So it was the women who wanted this culture to, to exist. So it was not the men who said, oh, beauty culture, beauty culture. No, it was the women who came up with the idea that there must be a beauty culture. And it was the women who insisted that the men become more handsome and they were groomed to look like very handsome men. They were groomed to become handsome. The men would have to become beautiful. So you know there is a group of people in the, the country called Chad. They are called the Wodabe. The Wodabe men in, the, in Chad, the Wodabe men are the ones who dress up for the women. The Wodabi men wear their hats and then they wear makeup on their face. They show their teeth, they, that they got good hygiene and good teeth. Their teeth is not rotting from, from not flossing and not brushing their, you know, they do that to show their teeth. See, my teeth are not rotting and I floss my, I floss, I take all the meat out of my teeth, etc. They show good teeth, strong teeth, shining teeth. They, they show their, all their, their beauty, their, their walk. They can walk like the swan. You know, all they, they can walk like the swan, the bird called the swan. They can walk like the swan. They're graceful. They're all these things. They show these things to the women in this country called Chad. But in Kemet, this was how all the men used to do. It was not just a, a few group of men doing that, but it was all the men were taught these things. Every man knew about singing, dancing, poetry, dressing well, hair, uh, clothes, grooming, hygiene, mannerism. All the men knew these things. 
um, uh, when they go through nephertum. Um, so the women were the one who insisted that the men had to learn how to groom themselves and the men had to become more than just wild men with dreadlocks, with their dreadlocks was not organized. Their dreadlocks was just long without organization. They were just uh, covered in cow urine in their hair and they were covered in uh, ashes. They would uh, bathe themselves in ashes. So they say, no, 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 you have to start grooming yourself. You have to start wear, wear red ochre on your skin, wear the red ochre on your skin and lather, lather your face with the red ochre, lather your body with the red ochre, and then dress up, right? Wear white. They, they told them to wear white, you know? So the men started to dress up. The men started to do their hair. The men started to design their hair, put butter in their hair, start to do all types of stuff, put red ochre in their hair. And this is all nephertum, when the men started to create their hygiene, take care of their hygiene. So... The Africans said Atum was the complete man. Now, Atum is the original divine man, the man that was at the beginning, the one who had the uh, uh, who was born with the pineal gland open. That's Atum, the complete man, the man who was born the, with the awakened pineal gland, the ascended man, the one who rode the winds, the man who could ride the wind, the man who could float, the man who could meditate and all that stuff. That was Atum. So, Hathor... So you know who Hathor is. This is Hathor. This is Hathor, the science of Venus. Um, for those of you who don't know what the science of Venus is, the science of Venus is what people call witchcraft. Venus means it's not witchcraft. Venus is not witchcraft. Witchcraft is a word. Uh, which is the word for woman. Is the word for woman, powerful woman. Who, who has init who has been, become initiated, who has graduated, and she is a master of the school of Venus or the school of Hathor. So when a woman uh, ascends out of the school of Hathor, she becomes uh, enlightened. She becomes a master of the school of Hathor. She has a lot of knowledge of, of herbs, plants, and all these types of stuff. So this woman, the Europeans used to call her a witchcraft or witch. She's not a witch. She's just a woman who has graduated in all the knowledge system. So that means she has reached a high level of knowledge in the system. So there is a man, when the man reached the grand priest, they called the man the grand priest, right? But when the woman reached the level, they call her the grand, the witch, right? The witch, because she is, uh, she has ascended to the highest level. So she's not a bad person. She's just uh, a, de a, a, a title that was demonized by the, Europeans uh, and the, the foreigners, and they obscured the, the woman. So uh, Hathor is the school where these women graduated from. So these women, there are seven signs of women. They would learn the seven signs of women. Um, Nefertum was the school that the women proposed for the education of the children. Uh, and both Kanum, the men and the priesthood came together and they proposed the school for the children. All the sexual knowledge that was originally used to belong to the school of Hathor. Originally, within the ancient time, before the mountain of the moon, from the mountain of the moon, Yalubali, all of that, they, the women used to control all the sexual knowledge. They knew all the knowledge about sexuality. And the women taught the men these knowledge. And then the men were uh, through Nefertum, through the school of Nefertum. So there was uh, astrology. In, uh, um, how do you call it? Uh, divination, um, philosophy. The women were were doing philosophy, healing, medicine, all the things that you can think of. The women were doing this stuff, and then it was uh, you know it was gradually taken away from them. Um, it was demonized. It was called they were called witch and witchcraft uh, because of their knowledge, and then they were they were uh, you know they couldn't practice the knowledge anymore. They couldn't be, you know, any more like, you know, a focus in that knowledge system anymore because of that. So all this is associated with the planet Venus, right? The Venus, Venus cycle, etc. So Hathor was the mother of Nefertum. Hathor is the mother of Nefertum. Uh, Nefertum uh, is the child uh, uh, before who, uh, and Atom is the, the man uh, who has completed, who has become 
the awakened man, the highest man, right? That's Atum. So after you go from Asar, the, the nature, man of nature, you go to Set, the man of the world, you go to Hor Heru, the ascended man, then you go to Atum, the complete man, the man who has become God, you know. So, you know, in uh, Buddhism, they say the Buddha became a, uh, the Buddha uh, became a God, right? He ascended, he went to Nirvana. So this is Atum, the Buddha would have achieved Atum. So that's what Atum is, right? In China, they say the yellow emperor ascended and he became a dragon, right? So this is Atum, the yellow emperor became that. So those are things like that. Um, flowers in general are associated with nephertum. So all kinds of flower, any kind of flower. If you buy a woman flower, you give a woman flowers, every one of these things associated with nephertum in Africa. Nephertum is the god of flowers. But the lotus is the king of the flowers, right? The lotus is the king of the flowers. It is the most beneficial flower that exists on earth. Out of all the flowers, the lotus is the most beneficial flower out of all the other flowers. So the lotus itself was associated with the sun. The lotus is the heat of life. It is the symbolic representation of life itself. The lotus represents life itself. The lotus emerges out of the, the, the muck, the, the seed, it opens, and then it comes out of the swamp. It, it grows in the swamp. Then it needs extreme heat. It needs extreme heat to blossom. So it lives in a murky water, et cetera, right? So existence, according to our ancestor, existence is to emerge. We have to emerge. The first energy in the universe is emergence. We emerge, to emerge to emerge, to emerge, to emerge, to emerge. Now, awaken is, now you go through an awakening. Awakening now is open, for something to open, for something, the eyes to open, that's the awakening. Then motivation, motivation is nephertum. Nephertum now is motivation, desire, love. Anything that has to do with love, desire, this is all nephertum. Then you go to movement, power, triangle, the triangle, the power. This is segment. So movement now is segment. The triangle, the power, the ability, this is all segment. Then centralization, this is all uh, Asar, Geb, uh, Geb, Asar, Pata, all of this, this is there. And then ascension, this is Heru, flight. When you become the free man, you become a free man and you gain the free will. You gain free will as a man or a woman. You gain free will, and then you become the complete man, Atum. You become the complete man. So Hathor is Venus, uh, the fiery planet. That is why they call her the Eye of Ra or the Eye of Ra because the planet Venus is the fiery planet. It is a fiery planet, so she's called the Eye of Ra. And everything that Venus, the other other influences that Venus has on planet Earth, she, the school of Hathor knows this knowledge. They know every single influence that the planet Venus has on the Earth. That's why Venus is associated with love, and that's why the Venus uh, is called Aphrodite, and her son is called Cupid because Hathor is the mother of Nephertum, and her son is called uh, 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 Nephertum. Right. So um, the fiery planet, uh, you know, she is the eye of Ra, if you look it up. And then there is this, uh, the science of Venus. So if you go and you say, uh, Google the devil's pentagram or or this, the devil's, let me Google it and see the devil, the devil's sign, the devil. So let me show you guys something, okay? So if you Google the sign of witchcraft, you get a star, right? And what is a star? It's two triangles, right? Two triangles, right? 
So you get different type of star. So this is all just triangles, right? They were all just triangles according to the ancient Africans. Um, the five elements. So we have the five elements, water, fire, earth, air, and spirit. Uh, these are all what was originally um, uh, the planet Venus represented. This was originally what um, the, you know, this was originally what uh, what was being taught at the school of Hathor. So at the school of Hathor, this is what people were learning. Um, this is what they call the duat. This is where the word duat comes from, right? Duat comes from this uh, this uh, science, right? There's the mysteries, the dark mysteries, um, all this stuff here. Duat comes from this. So the the um, the Europeans come in and they say it's the symbol of the devil, right? The okay. The circle. Okay, let me see this. So you see this, the, the circle of the devil right here. You see that? It's the same thing. You see that stuff? It's the same exact thing, right? But they come in. And they say this is the symbol of witchcraft and the symbol of the devil, <laughs> the symbol of the devil, you know, and they corrupt the culture, right? They take the African culture and then they, they, they do some stuff where they say this is the symbol of the devil. Well, it's not the symbol of the devil. It never was, right? It's the symbol of the African uh, priestess, the African women. Uh, it's their symbol or their science, the science of Venus. Um is the science of love, is the science of the mysteries, right? The elements. So all of these science are basically what our the women of Hathor used to practice. The women of Hathor, if you were, if you were a woman from the house of Hathor, you were a woman who was extremely, extremely intelligent. Extremely, extremely intelligent. You could do, you you had extremely potent powers extremely potent powers, right? You could heal any, almost any sickness. You could deliver babies. You could, uh, you know, do so many things. You were just like super, super. You had the knowledge of architecture. You had the knowledge of writing. You had the knowledge, all these type of knowledge you had, right? And you understood all the phases of the moon, the stars. You had all this knowledge if you were a woman who was from the house of Hathor. But Again, because the Europeans came and they corrupted it, we ended up with this foolishness. So planet Hathor is at the zenith. The, when planet Hathor is at the zenith, we have the evening star and the morning star. Uh, and when planet Hathor is at the zenith. So instead of, it used to be called planet Hathor, right? The, the planet, the eye of Hathor. So if you see between her horn, this is the eye of Hathor right here she's wearing. So this is the eye of Hathor she's wearing. She's not wearing, um, this, so this is planet Venus. This is Venus between her horn, right? So morning and evening star, that's what between her horn. So it got nothing to do with uh, this other stuff that these foolish people were saying. You know, you, you know, as Africans, this is the stuff you had to deal with. So, um, Planet Hathor at the zenith, the evening star and the morning star, uh, the cause and effect, the eighth star um, in the eighth star, I think in uh, Mesopotamia, they have the, uh, the eighth star of Asarte or Venus. This is the eighth star, right? Um, which is called the, the synodic, uh, synodic cycle of Venus. Then there's the 16 principles of Venus, um, the 16 triangles, there are 16 triangles, there's the five triangles, there's the six triangles, there's the seven triangles. All these are triangles, they're triangles of different signs. All of them are triangle, 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 right? And you as an African woman, you would learn all the different triangles. You would learn all these different triangles of, of, of energies and you could use all these energies. This is what the, the, the five 
star represent. It represented the five elements um, that you could you you would master chemistry. It, it represents a deep knowledge, like a high awakened person, you know, a, a goddess, so to speak. So the eighth star and the 16th principle, the eighth principle of Jehudi, what they call the eight hermetic, hermetic principles, they call it the hermetic principles. Well, those are the eight principles of Jehuti. It's not uh, uh, Hermes, it's Jehuti, right? So those are the eight principles of the house of life, uh, Jehuti. And so this is the Venus cycle. These, the women of this uh, school, Hathor, they knew all the cause and effect of the Venus cycle. They knew anytime Venus orbit the earth, they associated this with the pine cone, the pineal gland. They had some kind of uh, association with this uh, Venus synodic cycle with the pineal gland, awakening the pineal gland, et cetera. So that was, and there was other things involved, other science, other elemental knowledge, wisdom, nature, plant, herbs, divination, all these type of stuff was involved in this uh, Venus cycle. Um, Tehuti is the son of, Tehuti is the son of Hathor. Uh, that means that Tehuti, before uh, he became great, he was initiated in the school of Hathor and he learned all the knowledge of Hathor. Uh, Konshu, the crescent moon, um, when he was a child, he was taught the crescent moon, the science of the crescent moon. Um, he learned it in there, and then he became um, uh, the bull moon too. He learned uh, the principles of Sekhmet, the principles of justice. He learned that, and then Nefertum, uh, when the men learned the principles of love. Um, and this is all the things that African men had to learn. The divine love and the desire, the mandate of the creator, emergence, awakening, motivation, movement, centralization, ascension to open the mind's eye, to open the mind's eye and allow the thoughts to become enlightened. And the lunar eclipse and the solar eclipse, agriculture, heket, and sovereignty. All this stuff is the house of Hathor. And these were all taught in to the children. These were all taught to the children at Nefertum. So if you were an African child in Nefertum, uh, going to Nefertum, you were really well, it was like going to the best university uh, on, the, on the planet Earth. You were being given the best things in this university. Like it was a school for children to cultivate them into the pinnacle of extraordinary children. That's what made ne Nefertum so amazing. Nefertum was the original aspect of Atum, the complete one, uh, the warrior, uh, as a lion. The lion represents the warrior energy, the energy of violence, the energy of strength. And then the lion's claw represents the warrior's sword, the, 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 the sickle, the sword of the warrior, right? Uh, the blade, the blade, that's what the lion uh, represents, the cutlass, the machete. That is what the claw of the lion represents, the warrior's weapon. Um, and then the mastery of the warrior's weapon, uh, the falcon claw, and the falcon's wings represent the bow and arrow. So the falcon's claws and wings represent the bow and arrow, right? So the bow and arrow represents the falcon's claws and wings. So you had to learn, at Nefertum, you had to learn the mastery of the bow and arrow. So African children were taught the bow and arrow, the science of the bow and arrow. They were taught uh, the science of sword fight, uh, how to fight with a sword and how to uh, ride a chariot. They were taught all these things at Nefertum. So a young man goes to Nefertum. He comes out of Nefertum. This man is push, you know, at the top of his, his existence. He's the best there is. So this was, um, and then they had to learn projectile weapons. They had to learn hand-eye coordination weapons, weapons that had to do with hand-eye coordination. They are considered the beauty of men. All these principles were called the beauty of men. They make a man beautiful. They make a man handsome. They make a man, uh, according to the African women then, they believe that these are the things that made a man handsome. It was not like pretty, like today your face uh, had to be this way or that way, no. The beauty of a man was originally his expertise over his, his energy, his strength, his uh, weapon, his control of his weapon, his mastery of the blade and his mastery of the bow and arrow and hand-eye coordination 
all these were part of the beauty standard of men. And also, uh, Kemet uh, uh, is called Ta Seti. Nubia is called Ta Seti, the land of the bull. It's called Ta Seti, land of the bull, because of all these things I'm telling you. Okay? Now, the Minat necklace. This necklace right here is called the Minat necklace. So the Minat necklace, you can see it on certain men. You see Konshu? Uh, you see Konshu right here? Konshu wears the Minat necklace. You should be able to see the Minat necklace around his neck. Konshu wears the Minat necklace. Um, they're wearing a version of the Minat necklace. Uh, all of them are wearing a version of the Minat necklace. And these women are wearing the Minat necklace as well. So what is the Minat necklace? The Minat necklace, it means the butterfly necklace. This is called the butterfly necklace. Remember, what is Nefertum? Nefertum is a flower. Nefertum means the king or the, the lord of flowers. And what do flowers which animal loves the flowers? There are two animals that love the flowers, two insects that love the flowers, the butterfly and the bees. Those are the two creatures in nature that love flowers more than anything else, the butterfly and the bee, right? So the butterfly was the soul of a woman. The beauty of the soul of a woman is the butterfly. The beauty of the soul of the man is the bee, right? In uh, Remember, there's a lecture I did. Go to my YouTube channel. Go to my YouTube channel. And look at this lecture. It's called uh, the White Apis, the, the White Palace. It's called the White Palace. Apis the bull, the bee. So go to that and watch that lecture and you will see what I'm talking about. So um, that was that was what the, the two necklaces represent. One necklace was for the men, which was the bee. It represents the beauty of the man's soul. The bee represents the beauty of a man's soul and the butterfly represents the beauty of a woman's soul. Okay, so the butterfly necklace it's called the butterfly necklace, the Minat necklace, or the beauty of, of a soul, of a woman's soul, right? The beauty of a woman's soul. So if you see these women wearing this stuff, it means this is the beauty of their soul. So everything you see, these colors represent the beauty of the woman's soul. If you see the men wearing this, it represents the beauty of a man's soul. So this is how, what the Minat represents. The Minat represents the beauty of a woman's soul or a man's soul, all right? So um, the soul necklace, the black butterfly, who is, uh, there's a lecture I did on the black butterfly. Her name is uh, Neftis, and then she is a woman from Hathor. She's from the Hathor society, right? Um, and she becomes the vulture, Negbet right? And they, she used to wear the necklace around her neck. And this necklace was after the initiation of a woman, a woman was giving this to represent the beauty of her soul, to represent the beauty of her soul. But in the house of Nefertum, this was transferred over to men giving women this necklace as a gift to, de to declare their love for a particular woman. So if a man was in love with a, a particular woman. He wanted to declare his love for that woman. He was, uh, you know, wanted to marry her. The Manat necklace was what he gave to her. He gave her the beauty of her soul. This necklace represents the beauty of her soul. So he would give her the Manat necklace. And in exchange, she would give him the, the minis um, the, uh, to cover his uh, body, the minis to cover his body, which represents the bee, to represent the soul of a man, right? The the uh, the the what is it called? The nimis that he wears to cover to represent the soul of a man. So the beauty of the soul of a man. So these things 
were things that lived in the society that people give to each other uh, at Nefertum. Nefertum is where young people go to fall in love and they discover the power of love, you know, fall in love, give their, find the woman they're going to marry and then give the woman this uh, gift to show her that um, the beauty of her soul, right? Um, it's like finding your soulmate. It's the place where people go and find their soulmate. It's a perfect representation of beauty of the soul. Manat means the beauty of the soul. Okay, Nefertum was the profound love that was found within the soul. Jealousy destroys the love and beauty of the soul. So in, their, in, in, in this house, they were taught that jealousy can destroy the beauty of love and it can destroy the beauty of a person's soul. So they were encouraged to not be jealous. African women and men were taught to not ever feel jealousy, to, to get rid of jealousy because jealousy is going to destroy the beauty of the soul. Jealousy destroys the love, the beauty of the soul of a person. Insecurity destroys the love and the beauty of the soul. Anything that you are insecure, all that stuff, low self-esteem, it all destroys the beauty of the soul. So the type of love that is from the soul is called manat. Manat is the type of love that comes from the soul. It's your soulmate, the love that you, you have with your soulmate, right? So it's a very, very potent type of love. Um, and it's madi and siya, right? Desire, love within the soul is manat. The butterfly necklace protects the love, the beauty of the soul. The, butter, the butterfly necklace protect what it shows, it reveals the beauty of a person's soul. So that's why the African people wear that. The breath, the everything about the spirit, the breath, the heart, the love, the spirit of love, all of that is all menat. So if you see in this picture, he's giving the menat to uh, this woman. You know, he has given her the gift, you know, he's giving her to her, and she's receiving this, right? So this is what it is. It's a, uh, it means that the beauty of the woman's soul. That's what that represents. So the same thing. This uh, stuff it can be found all across Africa. Uh, men, men wear it still. If you see the men are wearing it, the beauty of a man's soul. They call it the Kalenjin co collar. Uh, this is what they call it is just means the beauty of a man's soul or the beauty of a woman's soul, right? So the butterfly necklace was the symbol of a wedding gift. So before you could get married, you had to give a, a gift to the woman and this gift had to reflect the beauty of her soul. And that was the manat was. To give the manat to a woman was to call her soul beautiful and to be in love with that soul. The fashion was invented during the period where the constellation of Gemini. So. As I told you, the ages, African history goes through the, from the Pisces, uh, Aquarius, Capricorn, uh, Sagittarius, Scorpio, Libra, uh, Virgo, and uh, Leo, uh, Cancer, and then uh, uh, Gemini. So this was what was created during the age of Gemini. This was created during the age of Gemini. Um, according to the story, um, the youth people, the young people used to be wild and unruly in the society. The young people, they were childish. They were undeveloped childish. The men were not growing up. The boys were, were very aggressive and all that stuff. And sometimes they were raped. People were raping. People were doing things that were bad. You know, all type of things were happening. So they created this house of Nefertum to teach all these people how to uh, cultivate them. So Hathor and Kanum, the two houses came together and established Nefertum to cultivate the violence, uh, the competitive nature of the young, to cultivate the ego of the young, to cultivate the quick to anger, you, the quick to anger, the anger of the youth, the thirst for war, even criminality and kidnapping and all these things. They built Nefertum to take the African youth away from crime. And this is how Nefertum was used. And so in East Africa, the people still walk around with the menat around their neck. They still walk around with the menat around their neck. And, you know, it's it's part of their day-to-day their, their -day life. 
you know, so the manat shows the reflection of this woman's soul. The, the manat here is the reflection of her soul. The manat is the reflection of the beauty of her soul. So all this is the beauty of her soul. This is the beauty of her soul, the beauty of her soul. So if you're looking at this woman, this woman is telling you, this is the beauty of my soul. So neck, neck bet or, or neka, neka bet is the uh, manat the beauty of the soul necklace, the black butterfly necklace, the butterfly necklace. So the butterfly necklace was, uh, belongs to women. It was the symbol of marriage, not just marriage. It was the symbol of the beauty of the soul of a person. During the Moon Dynasty, um, this was one of the most uh, important thing uh, about the egalitarian society that the Africans were living in. So um, it was created on the, uh, Pyramid Wars, this was the period when it was created, when the, the two joined in union, man and woman joined in union. And uh, this is the story of Nefertum. So this is the or graduate of Nefertum, the warrior who has graduated. Um, he is a warrior and he is uh, you know, an archer. He's, you know, an ascended man and he is a beautiful man. So he's all of the above. The Greeks will call this man Adonis. This is what the Greeks would say, Adonis. This is the African version of Adonis, the beautiful man. This is the beautiful man, the perfect man, the ideal man. So this is the Menat necklace that uh, people would give to each other as a symbol of love, as a symbol of Beauty, all right, the butterfly necklace. Um, we are done now. Um, any questions? Uh, if you don't have any questions, uh, share the video, like the video. Um, you know, as I've told you guys time and time again that YouTube will, you know, if you look at this channel, the channel was doing well. And then now YouTube, they make sure that the channel doesn't advance. They're really uh, making sure the channel doesn't go far. So it's up to all of you to share the teachings of the channel. It's up to all of you to, you know, uh, bring people to come and watch the video. Encourage them, tell them, you know, people you know to watch the teaching so that they can grow from it. Um, I don't have, if you don't have any questions, uh, then I'm going to sign out. Uh, this is what, um, if we were going to design um, the African education system, um, if we we're going to rebuild the African education system, we would have to use Nefertum as the, the structure for building the African education system. And we would have to uh, teach the young men and women uh, all these things. So, uh, Jackie, thank you for coming through positive energy and creation energy to you. Uh, I didn't realize you were here, but thank you. Um, I appreciate that. And positive energy and creation to energy to all those who came to watch. The one who comes in peace is always welcome. The one who comes to teach is always welcome. The one who comes to learn is especially always welcome. Take care and share the video, share the